I understand there's a much more interesting session across the hall. <laughs> Um, That's what happens when everything collapses on itself. Uh, three, two, one. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. This morning, we welcome Tre Secretary, Secretary of the Treasury, Stephen Mnuchin, to testify on the Department's Fiscal 2020 Budget Request. Mr. Secretary, thank you for being here today. The FY20 budget for the Department of Treasury is $12.7 billion, which is $62 million below the FY19 enacted level. In addition, the budget proposes $362 million in BCA cap adjustment funding for IRS program integrity activities. As in prior years, the request again proposes cuts to IRS that will reduce the resources available to support taxpayers and weaken the agency's ability to protect the integrity of our tax system. The request again proposes to eliminate funding for discretionary grant programs within the Community Development Financial Institutions Fund and goes a step further by proposing to rescind $25 million in CDFI funding that Congress restored in the FY19 bill. And it again slashes funding for the Special Inspector General for TARP by 24%, despite the continued obligation of billions of dollars for TARP programs that will continue into 2023. While there are many areas of concern in the administration's request, I do want to call attention to one bright spot. I am pleased to see the budget includes increases for both the Office of Terrorism and Financial Intelligence and the Financial Crimes Enforcement Network. I look forward to hearing from you today on how the department plans to use these funds in addition to the significant increases that Congress appropriated in FY18 and FY19 to enhance efforts to combat terrorism, financing, and money laundering, and to enforce economic and trade sanctions. <clears throat> <clears throat> Lastly, I must take this opportunity to comment on the department's plan to divert up to $601 million from the Treasury Forfeiture Fund to pay for the construction of physical barriers along the southern border. I understand $242 million has already been transferred to the Department of Homeland Security. This is $242 million that could have been used to augment IRS criminal investigations. $242 million that could have been used to support Homeland Security investigations into financial crimes, money laundering, human trafficking, and intellectual property theft. $200 million that could have been used and spent on tools to help the Coast Guard team search for illegal drugs on board vessels at sea. The decision to redirect these funds toward border fencing recklessly undermines the ability of Treasury and Homeland Security to address known threats and instead use it for a symbolic campaign promise. Before I turn to our witness for his statement, I would like to recognize Mr. Graves for his opening remarks. Thank you, Mr. Graves. Thank you, Chairman Quigley. Uh, welcome back, Secretary. It's good to have you uh, back with us. And um, last time you were with our subcommittee, uh, Congress had just passed the Tax Cut and Jobs Act. And uh, in that you know, 15 months later, GDP continues to grow. Unemployment rates at the lowest rate it's been in uh, over 50 years now. The economy has added more than 5 million jobs uh, since the President took office, and uh, your team's been put to work. 80% of individuals now are paying lower taxes this year. Businesses have lower regulatory and compliance costs, and it's easier for families and business owners to file their taxes. Thanks to your leadership and the administration, we appreciate all you've done uh, to, uh, to get us to this point. But I do want to commend you, along with uh, Treasury and the IRS staff, uh, who've worked so hard to implement the tax reform for this filing season. I know it's been a tremendous amount of work for everybody, and uh, with Congress didn't make it much easier for you when we had uh, just a, a little bit of a lapse of... Uh, uh, funding for about 30 plus days. I know that made it a little bit more challenging, but so far it seems tax filing season is proceeding without uh, any notable problems. And if there are some, maybe you can highlight them for us today. But regarding the administration's budget proposal, uh, I appreciate that uh, you're making some important investments in, in the military and border security while making tough choices uh, to reduce spending. That's, that's across the board when we've seen this budget proposal. The debt nearly doubled under the previous administration. We sometimes forget uh, how that occurred and when it occurred, but it, it did. It's a debt that has been inherited by this administration, 
And uh, I appreciate what you've been doing as well as the entire team with the Trump administration working within the budget limitations that Congress has placed on you. And I understand the request for the Treasury Department includes important investments in sanctions enforcement, national security reviews for foreign investments, cybersecurity and IT infrastructure at the IRS, all very important investments, and thank you for your focus on that. And uh, I look forward to working with Chairman Quigley in the days ahead as we uh, formulate uh, a budget that uh, we know your, your department will have the sufficient resources necessary to carry out your mission. And uh, Mr. Chairman, I'll be happy to yield back at this time, but thanks again for holding this, uh, this hearing today. Thank you, Mr. Graves. Uh, Secretary, I thank you so much for being here today. Without objection, your full written testimony will be entered into the record. With that in mind, we would ask for you to please summarize your opening statement in five minutes. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here with you today. Chairman Quigley, Ranking Member Graves, and members of the subcommittee, I'm pleased to join you today to discuss the President's fiscal 2020 budget and the priorities for the Treasury Department. I am proud to report that President Trump's program of tax cuts, regulatory relief, and improved trade deals is resulting in the strongest economic growth since 2005 and the best job markets in generations. Uh, I would like to highlight some key issues for you today. I would note that opportunity zones are a key component of the Tax Cut and Jobs Act. They will help more Americans benefit from our strong economy. Opportunity zones offer capital gains tax relief for investments in businesses in distressed communities. We are seeing a great deal of enthusiasm for this policy across the country. The administration is making trade a top priority. I urge all members of Congress to support the passage of the U.S.-Mexico-Canada Agreement. It will create the highest standards ever negotiated to protect intellectual property rights, provide strong support for small and medium-sized businesses, encourage manufacturing, open markets for American agricultural products. We are also making progress negotiating with China to rebalance our economic relationship, end unfair trade practices, open their economy to American companies, and protect our critical technology. Turning to the President's 2020 budget for the Treasury Department, it reflects our key goals of maintaining strong economic growth as well as protecting America's national security and technology infrastructure. We are requesting $35 million to continue implementing FIRMA Modernization Act. This legislation, which passed overwhelming bipartisan support, modernizes the Committee on Foreign Investment in the United States, known as CFIUS Review Process. FIRMA enhances CFIUS' ability to analyze transactions for national security while preserving our commitment to an open investment environment. The budget provides for increased funding for TFI and for the Financial Crimes Enforcement Network, FinCEN. These funds will be used to continue to protect the financial systems abuse by rogue regimes and actors, including terrorists, transnational organized crime, proliferators of weapons of mass destruction, and other threats to our country. The funding includes critical investment in information technology and mission support capabilities. It also supports the Terrorist Financing Targeting Center and implementation of the Countering America's Adversity Act, known as CATSA. It also further expands FinCEN's ability to combat cybercrime and prevent the illicit exploitation of emerging payment systems, including cryptocurrency. I'd like to highlight two other initiatives, which are modernizing the IRS and the proposed integrity cap adjustment. Our 2020 request for $290 million for the business system's modernization account is the first installment that will go towards upgrading IRS systems and operation. This plan will reduce long-term costs of maintaining these systems and dramatically improve taxpayer service. We are also requesting a program integrity cap to allow the IRS efficiently collect taxes, enforce our tax code, prevent fraud, including by modeling compliance risks and preventing identity theft. We anticipate that a $15 billion investment over 10 years would generate over $45 billion in additional revenue. Finally, I would note the budget includes additional support for the Office of Critical Infrastructure, which is the protection and compliance policy to help Treasury identify and reduce emerging threats and vulnerability to our financial systems. I look forward to answering your questions, and uh, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here with you. 
Thank you, sir, and we appreciate that. So yesterday I was asked what questions I would ask you today, and it just seemed humorous to me at the time, uh, suggesting it wasn't going to be about the how your NCAA brackets had gone, but how'd they go? Uh, I, I'm a bigger fan of professional basketball. I got so it. I'm not an expert at NCAA. All right. So, uh, so the press doesn't think I totally misled them. Let me get to the, the point. Uh, last week, we were well aware that the Chairman of Ways and Means under 6103 of the 6103 of the tax code requested the President's tax returns. And we can get into the issue of what that answer should be, but at first, I think it's more important that we talk about who should make that decision. And with respect, whether or whether or not you, Mr. Secretary, should be involved in that decision. Um, we're aware of a long-standing delegation order that the Secretary does not get involved in taxpayer-specific matters and that the IRS Commissioner has that responsibility. Quote, the Commissioner of Internal Revenue shall be responsible for the administration and enforcement of the internal revenue laws. In addition, uh, this is not a delegation that's easily revocable. Uh, federal law provides that if uh, you decide not to delegate such a power, that decision, that determination, shall not take effect until 30 days after you, Mr. Secretary, uh, notifies the tax writing and other specified committees. So it raises the question as whether a decision to decide this uh, by yourself is appropriate and legal. So let me begin with that and get your reaction as to whether or not uh, you should be the one making that sort of decision, sir. Well, uh, for first, first let me comment that uh, I do look forward to talking about our budget. Um, I, we're we're going to get there, sir. I, I, I'm not surprised uh, on, on this question, so better we get this out. I want to surprise beginning. you with that first question, but uh, it didn't you, work. You, did, you did surprise me on the first question. Um, let, let me just comment that, uh, uh, for, first of all, I, I want to acknowledge that uh, we did receive the request, and as I've said in the past, uh, when we received the request, it would be reviewed by our legal department, and it is our intent to follow the law, and that is in the process of being reviewed. Um, now, in regards to let, your let specific me just question. Uh, so let me interject. I apologize. But what part are they reviewing, whether or not, or whether your office should be the one that makes the ultimate decision? Are they, are they reviewing whether or not you should make that decision as well, sir? I, it would be premature for me to comment specifically what they are reviewing on or what they're not reviewing on. But I, I, I would highlight, okay, I think as you know, the law calls for a request to me. Uh, as you've said, uh, there is a tradition of delegating certain responsibilities. I would just comment that it is my responsibility to supervise the commissioner. But again, I, I think it would be premature at this point uh, to make any specific comments uh, other than, as I've been consistent before in saying, uh, it, it is being reviewed uh, by the legal departments, and uh, we look forward to responding to the letter. Well, uh, in case they're curious, we can reference Treasury Order 150-10 and uh, Section 6103, which talks about the disclosure to committees of Congress on these points, uh, and we go back. Uh, that was... April 22nd, 1982, the previous order dates back to uh, St. Patrick's Day, uh, 1955. So it would seem that the matters of who makes the decision is pretty clear. Uh, my concern is that we're going to get past that point, and the decision as to whether to pass these on uh, will have already been made. But le let me ask you in the meantime, the White House Chief of Staff made his thoughts on this pretty clear. Uh, have you spoken to the White House Chief of Staff or the President about this decision? I have not spoken to the White House Chief of Staff or the President about this decision. Has anyone from the White House talked to you about this decision? Uh, to me personally or to other people uh, within my Well, department? you personally first, 
and to other people second. I have not had any conversations with anybody in the White House about this oh, issue. Any personally. communication? Uh, I personally have not had any communication uh, with anybody in the White House, although I want to be specific that relates to me and not everybody at Treasury. Okay. So, to your knowledge, has anybody in the administration communicated with anybody in your office about this decision? Our, our legal department has had conversations prior to receiving the letter uh, with the White House General Counsel. And did they brief you as to the contents of that communication? Uh, they have not briefed me to the contents of that communication. I believe that was purely informational. You believe what was purely? I believe that the communication between our legal department and the White House General Counsel was, pre was uh, informational, that we obviously had read in the press that we were expecting this. So they communicated just to say expect this, or did they talk about their views in any way, shape, or form as to how you should Again, respond? Mr. Chairman, I want to be clear. I, I personally wasn't involved in those conversations. I, again, I want to be very clear and not be misleading. I acknowledge that there were conversations. I, I am not briefed on the full extent of those conversations. And I would also just comment those have been prior to us receiving the notice. Yeah, because they saw the handwriting on the wall. Um, we're gonna I, th I think, as you know, it was widely advertised in the press beforehand, so this sure. wasn't exactly a state secret that we thought we'd be getting it. I think this committee would like to know if in those communications the White House expressed their desire to you or anybody else at uh, Treasury what their views or how you should act on this matter. So if you could pass that on, sir, we would greatly appreciate it. I'll pass on to Mr. Graves now. Hey, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Mnuchin, Secretary, it's, uh, it, it's interesting how these committee meetings and appropriations have turned into investigative uh, hearings, uh, putting different individuals from the administration on trial, it seems, at times. And, and so, uh, you know, Mr. Chairman, it's, it's uh, I, I think, fair for the Secretary to respond that they're going to fully comply with the law when I think we all know this is a political stunt by the new majority who just couldn't wait to get a gavel and to scour through all the rules of the Ways and Means Committee into how they might use their political power and influence to retaliate against a, a, a political opponent that they just disagree with, they don't like. You didn't like the, the outcome of the Mueller report, so now we've got to issue a subpoena uh, and, and request that the Attorney General uh, break the law. And, and reveal classified information and other things. It's, uh, it's remarkable to, to watch this occur. Uh, so, Mr. Secretary, I appreciate um, your good work, what you've done. I've, as I said in my opening statement, all that you've done to assist the economy to make sure that there are plenty of jobs being created, five million new jobs since the administration took place. The um, GDP is growing strong. Unemployment's at a 50-plus year old or 50-plus uh, uh, year rate of, of, of the lowest ever uh, in the 50 plus years, and yet what do we want to talk about? Tax returns. Why? I'm sure the President has filed the financial disclosures as required by law, and I don't see any questions about that, um, but for some reason, uh, the new majority just wants to peek in, peek in a little bit further, and because they're just determined to prove something that they think might exist somewhere, uh, and it, in each turn they get turned down and, and it's proven false. In fact, there was no collusion, there was no obstruction but that's not enough, and here we go again with something else. It might not ever end. Um, but uh, halfway through this administration, y'all are doing a fantastic job. I'll go to uh, uh, something more pertinent to the day, and that is uh, tomorrow we understand that in the uh, House Financial Services Committee there's going to be um, uh, the chairman and CEO, Jamie Dimon, is going to testify, and he is uh, hopefully going to speak a little bit about cybersecurity. That's one of your priorities, and I'm grateful for that. But the chairman and uh, CEO said, that the threat for cybersecurity of cybersecurity may very well be the biggest threat to the U.S. financial system, and that they spend about six hundred million dollars every year just to ward off cybersecurity attacks. You've made an investment, at least a request in your budget, for seven point seven million dollars of an increase to strengthen the uh, financial sector cybersecurity infrastructure. Um, you, you're taking that threat seriously, and uh, we, we appreciate that. Um, could you just give us a little bit of a glimpse. Is the financial sector sufficiently prepared uh, in, in your mind to manage large-scale uh, business disruptions, data disclosures, and other cyber events? Um, 
talk about that for a second. Sure. Well, th th thank you very much. I mean, l let me just comment that uh, cyber issues specifically relates to the financial infrastructure, which uh, is a responsibility of the Treasury Department working with DHS, is something that we take very, very seriously. And this requires an ongoing investment. This is not just a one-time investment. This will focus on a continuing investment. Um, I am actually hosting a meeting tomorrow afternoon of, of those CEOs at the Treasury Department, specifically with our cybersecurity experts. Uh, I will be having uh, representatives of both uh, DHS and uh, the intelligence community there with me, as well as a session with the regulators. So this, this is one of the highest priorities for the department, and this is something we will continue to work with the private sector. The private sector has the primary responsibility, but this is an area where we need to improve the effectiveness of the U.S. government working with the private sector to prevent what could be both state actions and non-state actions attacks to our, our infrastructure. The additional $7.7 .7 million um, that you're requesting, share with us a little bit about how you expect to use that, how that might help with that goal. Um, that, that, that is to staff up uh, our internal department to do this. Um, I think, to be honest with you, this is a rather modest uh, request, given the size and, and the significant risk. And this may be something uh, that we'll come back to in the future and ask for more money, just as we appreciate. We've asked for more money for TFI. I think that's been very effectively used. We appreciate it. Uh, this is a modest investment and something we may come back to you because it's, it's one of the most important areas. Great. Well, thank you, Secretary. Thanks for being here and joining thank us today. You. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ms. Kirkpatrick. She's in. Ms. Torres. Yeah. Secretary Mnuchin, I understand that a total of $9.6 billion has been provided uh, for the hardest hit fund since its creation. How much of that funding is left? Uh, I'm, I'm not aware of that specific number, but is, I, I in the past two years, what are the main purposes for which the funds have been used? So the the hardest hits funds, I, I believe, as you know, were, was money that was. You, I, uh, I know what it is. Just answer my question, please. Uh, can you repeat your question? In the past two years, what are the main purposes for which those funds have been used? Th they have been allocated to different states. Uh, for various different purposes, as as the funds are specified, it's not it's it's not an arbitrary situation. Exactly, what were they been used? You don't know. Uh, Can you follow up with my office and let me know? Uh, absolutely. Thank it's, you. It's for it's for various mortgage related issues in in different parts in the states. But we're happy to to give you a more I detailed appreciate that. update. Uh, with the president's decision to spend up to six hundred and one million on the border wall out of the TFF, can you tell me? What other law enforcement activities will not be supported in fiscal year 20, uh, 2019? I, I don't know the answer to that. Uh, the request for the fundings was a request that came from DHS for law enforcement purposes. Uh, DHS has prioritized the different things. I, I can't tell you. It's not within my domain. Okay, so law enforcement purposes are only a priority at the border but not in our communities? Uh, I I again, those are law enforcement purposes are not within the Treasury's domain as it relates to these issues. We transferred the funds and DHS has prioritized them. In prior years, Treasury has sought to maintain a minimum of 100 to 150 million in the TFF for operating expenses for the subsequent fiscal year. Treasury's latest reporting to the subcommittee uh, projects that there will be only be $71 million remaining in the TFF at the end of fiscal year 2019. Are you concerned that the projected balances will be insufficient to fund essential operations for fiscal year 2019? I, I, I'm not. That was somewhat of an arbitrary number. I'm sorry, I thought I answered. I said I'm, I'm not concerned. The $100 million was a somewhat of an arbitrary number. Is that enough? Uh, 71, um, that number that you have that is projected to be left, is that enough to fund current activities? I, I believe it could, but we'll look at that in the context of our overall funding. Okay. 
Moving on to CDFIs, in California's 35th district, which I represent, there are 252 loans and investments that were made using resources um, supplied by CDFI funding, totaling nearly 37 uh, million. This, this means that more, more for small family-owned businesses. Um, in crafting the fiscal year 2020 budget, you had a fantastic opportunity to change you know, the, the fact that there are cuts to this program, but you didn't. Um, you're proposing a 94% decrease. Um, can you tell me why? Sure. Well, let me just acknowledge uh, that, that I do believe that the CDFI program uh, does uh, make significant contributions to certain communities, and, and I've, I've seen this firsthand both in, in my role at Treasury and my prior experience. Um, this was just a difficult decision of allocating money between different priorities within the Treasury, and we look forward to working with you and the committee uh, as you ultimately decide how we spend the money. Um, I just want to clarify, certain communities are the communities that I represent, which are made up of the working poor. These are people that are working two or three jobs that don't have a checking account that can match yours or anyone else in this room, probably. Um, so these programs are critical, and I hope that we can find a way to make it um, work so that they don't have to suffer, these programs don't have to suffer a 94% cut. I, I appreciate that, and as I said, I've acknowledged, I've seen firsthand the benefit of many of these programs, so we look forward to working with you and the rest of the committee. I only have five minutes. I don't have time for NICE, so I apologize for just getting on. Thank you. Ms. Stewart. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Secretary, thank you for being here. Uh, we appreciate uh, the time you take and look at the oversight by Congress is a fundamental constitutional prerogative. It's something that's important, and these hearings are an important part of that. Uh, I, I do have a, a few questions I'd like to bore down on. Before I do, I <clears throat> can't not address the elephant in the room, and that's the conversation already, <clears throat> and I express my, my view and concerns about this, and that's the push for tax returns, which I just think is political nonsense. I think most Americans can, can see for what it is, and that's it's just politically motivated intrusion into basic fairness and basic privacy. And if that's not true, then I'd ask, did Chairman of Ways and Means release his tax returns? Has other members of and chair men and chairwomen of other committees released their tax returns? Did the Clinton Foundation or former secretary release their tax returns? Why isn't every member of Congress and every senator required to release their tax returns? And the answer is because we have an expectation of right and a right of privacy. And, uh, and, and, and you're right. The chairman of Ways and Means has in a, in a confined way the authority to request these. But it's got to be for a legitimate legislative purpose. And I would challenge anyone when, when asking for these tax returns to define what that legislative purpose is. What are they investigating? And I think it's exactly what the ranking member said. This is nothing more than they disagree with an individual on their policies and their programs and their politics, and they want to punish that person. And this is the only way they can do it. They've been trying for two years. And it has failed and failed and failed. And so they'll say, well, let's try tax returns. Maybe there's something there. We have no evidence that there's anything nefarious. We have no evidence that there's any wrongdoing, but maybe we'll find something. And if you're going to have that be your standard, then have that be your standard for every member of Congress or for any other American citizen. And I think most Americans reject that. There's a ba the only way our, our, the only way this works is if there's American people trust the IRS and trust that this information will be held private. And if it's not, if that's violated, then people will quit complying. And as we rely on voluntary compliance, by and large, for our tax policy to, and, and those programs to be implemented, that will dissolve underneath us if people lose that basic sense of fairness. And that's the only thing this will do, is dissolve that basic sense of fairness that people are treated the same regardless of what position they may have or regardless of their politics. So once again, what is the legislative purpose of requesting these tax returns? What are you investigating? What crime or misdeed are you, are you alleging here? 
And if you have, don't have the answer to that question, then you have no right to pursue this. <clears throat> we sent you a letter, and I know you've received hundreds, I suppose, letters. I don't expect you to recall this off the top of your head, but I would like you to, to answer back if you could and maybe follow up with this. I have supported sanctions against Russia in almost every fashion. I think they're a very important tool for us to punish them and to change their behavior regarding America's interest. The uh, Counting Americans Adversaries Through Sanctions Act was one I supported. It, in, it includes sanctions on financial services, energy, and defense. We have vigorously sanctioned in those areas. It also authorizes sanctions in metals and mining, and we haven't done any of that at all. Mr. Secretary, we sent you a letter last fall requesting that you look at the uh, sanctioning Russian potash. Uh, now, this is important to me because the only potash producer in, in the entire country is in my district. And, uh, and I, I'm wondering if you can give us an update on a response to that letter and what your views are regarding our concerns in that letter. Sure. Well, first of all, let me just say, uh, I actually do make a point of trying to read all the letters that come in, and I can't always recall all of them, so that's why my staff uh, appropriately just gave me copies of this. But let me just first acknowledge uh, sanctions are a very important tool. We've used them, I believe, very effectively against Russia. We will continue to use them against Russia for bad behavior, to try to change behavior. Um, I want to be careful in a public setting that we don't comment on future sanctions, but I can assure you that my office will follow up. Uh, your request is something we're taking very seriously, and without implying we're going to do something or not do something because I don't want to publicize it, uh, I can assure you we're taking your request very seriously. Okay. <clears throat> and my time has expired, but I would, I would add this. Thank you for taking it seriously. We sent this letter nearly six months ago. Whether you agree or disagree, I do think that you owe us a response on this. So we would look forward to uh, your formal response to this, uh, to this request. And Chairman, thank you, and I yield back. I, I think we actually did respond to it, so I, I apologize if there's been some confusion on that on, on March 11th, but we'll get you another copy. Thank you, Mr. Stewart. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. I'm uh, sure that President Obama is relieved that the Republicans didn't use their oversight authority and committee structure to analyze and dissect any part of his administration. So I'm, I'm sure he's relieved that that never happened. Uh, Mr. Cartwright. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, and thank you, Secretary Mnuchin, for joining us again this year. Uh, just down the hall, we have Attorney General William Barr. Did you guys take the same cab over? Um, it, we, we did not, but uh, as, as I referenced before, I'm sure his is even more interesting than ours is this morning. <laughs> don't sell yourself short, Secretary. Uh, and if you do happen to bump into uh, the Commerce Secretary, uh, we're still waiting for him to show up. We're waiting by the telephone. We'd still love to hear his testimony this year. I wanted to ask you about the Community Development Financial Institution Fund, and you're aware of what that is, right? The administration has proposed essentially eliminating uh, that fund by reducing funding from $250 million in fiscal year 2019 down to $14 million uh, for the year going forward. That's a 94 percent decrease, and by my way of thinking, it represents a, pretty much a complete abandonment of that program by the administration. In previous years, the administration has justified these kinds of dr drastic cuts by s stating that the CDFI industry, quote, has matured, unquote, and that, quote, these institutions should have access to private capital needed to build capacity, extend credit, and provide financial services to the communities they serve, unquote. The question for you is I I'd like to know the basis for your conclusion regarding the relative maturity of the CDFI industry. Has there been a report or a study uh, done by your agency that assesses the likelihood of private investors filling that gap left by defunding CDFI? Uh, Mr. Cartwright, uh, Mrs. Torres just asked me a similar question on this. So uh, again, I apologize you didn't, you didn't hear, but let me reiterate what I said, which is first of all, I do want to acknowledge that I do think the CDFI funds provide many benefits to many communities, that our decision here was based upon making difficult decisions on funding various different 
programs across the Treasury Department, and we look forward to working with you and the rest of the committee on specific allocations. Uh, I, I did miss your answer before. Did she ask you uh, whether you'd done a report or study to analyze whether there is a likelihood of private investors filling the gap left, left behind defunding CDFI? I didn't. I apologize. I didn't answer that specifically for you. I don't believe we've done a report, although I will, I will check. But as I've said, I, I, I want to acknowledge that we look forward to working with the committee on this funding. And I want to encourage you to... Um, commission such a study or a report so that we're basing our decisions on, you know, facts and evidence. I think that's a good idea, and I will, I will encourage the staff to review this and do additional research on it, either internally or externally. Perfect. Um, the National Association of Federally Insured Credit Unions issued a statement opposing that elimination of CDFI funding. Uh, did you see that? I, I haven't seen it specifically, but I'm not surprised. Not surprised. In, in my previous life, I, I was a banker, and I'm familiar with, right. again, as I've said, I've seen specifically in certain communities where these have helped. So we look forward to working with you on this. Glad to know you're, you're, you've been paying attention. They said this, without the CDFI fund grant program, many CDFI credit unions would not have been able to offer new products and loans that provide financial stability for members and their families, unquote. And this statement seems to contradict uh, your position that the CDFI industry has fully matured. Uh, what do you know about the CDFI industry that the NAFCU apparently doesn't know? Uh, do you believe that you're in a better position to judge the maturity of the CDFI industry than CDFI credit unions themselves? I suppose the answer to that is all wrapped up on uh, in uh, in the study that I hope you're going to commission. Yeah. Yes, and let me just acknowledge whether whether the industry has matured or the industry hasn't matured. Uh, like many other programs, even if it's matured, there could still be benefits of certain things. Again, this was a difficult decision on funding across various different programs, and we look forward to working with you. And perhaps, given the popularity of this program within certain areas of Congress will reconsider it uh, if it's funded and how we propose it in next year's budget. Okay. So operating without studies or analyses, uh, you're working on assumptions. And my question is, how many other aspects of the Treasury's uh, proposed budget are also based only on assumptions? And how much credence uh, should we be putting in this administration's budget uh, uh, based on assumptions and not facts and evidence? I'd be happy to discuss any of the specifics with you on any of the requests. Obviously, with an entire department, there's certain things I'm personally very involved with. If you want to talk about IRS modernization, that's something I'm very interested in. The TFI funding, there's many things I can comment on the specifics of and have we've reached the decision, but obviously not every single line item uh, itself. Well, thank you, Mr. Secretary, and my time is up. Yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. The gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Joyce. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and thank you very much, Secretary Mnuchin, for taking the time to be with us this morning. <clears throat> um, last year, I was not a member of this committee, uh, subcommittee, but uh, during committee subcommittee hearing on the budget, I uh, had uh, discussed an issue of which the next day you came out and, and, and talked out. I really wish I w we would have been flipped it by a day. It would have probably been very helpful. But it's regarding the issue of access to banking for the cannabis industry. And you, you described that conflict as untenable. Just last year, you stated that reviewing the existing guidance, referring to the 2014 policy memo, meant to provide direction for banks on how to service cannabis businesses. If I can quote you for a moment, we do want to find a solution to make sure that the businesses that have large access to cash have a way to get them into a depository institution for it to be safe. I couldn't agree with you more, sir. My 25 years as a prosecutor, I think there's a horrible situation that's sitting out there, and we need to get that. But I, I, I want, I've taken to, to introduce some legislation to clarify the existing discrepancy between state and federal cannabis laws. While I'm not asking you for an official position on my bill, I'd like to hear your thoughts on how this body can be more helpful when it comes to banking asset, access for legitimate cannabis businesses. And I'd really like to work with you because I believe you're right on this and the current situation is untenable. Uh, so 
who on your senior staff could we work with to try to find some solutions for for both of us? Um, I, I'd be pleased to follow up with you directly and bring a team up. Um, again, without having a policy view on the conflict of federal law versus state law, for many areas that fall under the Treasury Department, this creates a significant conflict. Everything from the IRS, which wants to collect taxes and has to build specific cash rooms to hold cash, to me working with the banking regulators, where there are conflicts. So uh, I, I would encourage this is something that we're happy to, we're not taking a policy position on the conflict of federal versus state, but uh, this is something that is, is, it does create a conflict in our ability to administer many areas. Certainly if you went and spent $20,000 cash on a car, you'd kick off a SARS, or and if you come in to pay your taxes with $100,000 in cash, please come on in. You know, we'll gladly accept it. That, to me, doesn't make any sense. It needs to be something we need to work to cure, uh, and I look forward to working with you on that. But Treasury has issued guidance clarifying that certain tax-exempt bonds maintain tax-exempt status when refinanced, but has not yet issued such guidance for the tribal economic development bonds. Tribes are beginning the process of refinancing their bonds now, and in the absence of such guidance, will face significant and unanticipated cost increases. Does Treasury still intend to issue such guidance? And if so, will you please do so can expedite its completion? Um, we're in the process of issuing, as you can imagine, uh, an enormous amount of guidance as it relates to the Tax Act. So I'm not aware of this specifics, but uh, I assure you I will check with the staff and we will follow up with you to see where that is. We have many hearings on today, and I'm the ranking member in Interior where this, these Indian issues will come up, tribal issues will come up more often. So that's why I have a, a interest in making sure that we can fix those. So completely understand. Thank you. And, you know, another one was that the Treasury Tribal Advisory Committee was authorized in 2014 to advise the Secretary on all tax matters related to Indian Country. Appointees to the committee have been chosen by Congress and Treasury, and the charter is written. Unfortunately, Treasury has never convened a meeting of this committee. Is it your intent to convene a meeting of this committee, and if so, when? Uh, I wasn't aware that we hadn't done that, so I appreciate you bringing it to my attention. I, I have no idea why it sounds like we should convene that, so we will follow up with that. Thank you for bringing it to my attention. Well, thank you for following up. Um, and lastly, uh, the Opportunity Zone program creates tax incentives for investment in designated census tracts, which are economically challenged. Many of these Opportunity Zones include lands held in trust by the federal government for tribes. But because Treasury's draft regulations require funds to be used to purchase and improve property in designated zones, they inadvertently exclude these lands held in trust and also inadvertently exclude tribal governments from being eligible. We look into this matter, and if the exclusion was in fact inadvertent, you can do what you can to ensure that the final regulations include tribal governments and lands held for these tribes and trusts? Yes, that, that, that issue I'm somewhat uh, more uh, aware of. And let me just comment in general. I think the Opportunity Zones are a very important uh, program, and this is something that I hope that people can work across party lines as we continue to implement this. Um, there are some technical issues, as you've said. This is a highly technical issue that we're trying to figure out how we solve. We don't yet have resolution to. I certainly appreciate your time and, and being here today. And on and, and behalf of my other members who might have got up and left, there seems to be only four of us on every committee, and as you know, there's other hearings that are taking place today, so uh, they've left to hit 10 other hearings. I will be leaving, and it has nothing to do with disrespect for you, sir. It was just the fact that I have other hearings we have to attend as well. I yield back. Thank you, sir, and the gentleman should be commended for his clear, consistent, ongoing uh, concern for the uh, issue related to cannabis banking and the related issues that go with it. Um, and, and Mr. Secretary, I, I, I want to touch on, before we go where we started this, but you're, you're correct in discussing the issues of FI-20. Uh, let me let you take some time to address an area of concern that's come to our attention, and that is the uh, reports, then the quote is mass exodus of staff due to internal disagreements and lack of direction. Uh, can you address the concerns within Treasury of loss of staff? I don't, I don't believe we have. So if there's specific questions you have, but uh, we have not lost 
staff due to issues or anything else. So despite what may or may not be written in the press, it's just not factually correct. I just wanted to get your answer, sir, on the record. And But toward that end, uh, FY 2020 proposes to cut funding for the Treasury Inspector General for Tax Administration by $4.25 million and to hold the Treasury Inspector General at flat funding despite the extraordinary growth in funding for other department offices, including a 41.4 million increase for department salaries and expenses, 7.7 .7, uh, for Office of Terrorism and Financial Intelligence. So there are parts of the agency that are growing, except for those that oversee and, and, and do inspections of how you are doing. Uh, can you justify at this point in time cutting the watchdog while parts of the agency are otherwise growing? Uh, again, we'd be happy to follow up with your staff on the specifics of any of this. So I, I think when you, you drill down into the numbers, you can't just look at the, the headline number. You have to look at, in the case of the departmental offices, I said, it's specific increases in areas like uh, CFIUS and others that are, are for national security. Um, as it relates to the inspector generals, uh, I fully support uh, the role of the inspector generals in the department, both in taxes and uh, in other areas. And uh, again, we'd be happy to go through the specifics of how these were built and the recommendations. But your initial reaction to the fact that uh, at least one of those inspector general offices is going to be cut and the other one will get flat funding. Uh, I can't imagine anyone believes that their agency is is uh, of a mind that it can't be inspected and shouldn't have uh, a hearty inspection of those issues that's, is it, that, that they are working on. Well, the, the, the significant reduction, the only significant IG reduction is, is the area of TARP, and the reason for that is that program is discontinued. So still that, has programs that are going to be operating funding through for some period of time, though, right? Uh, yeah. and, and again, we're happy to go through the specifics, but those ongoing programs are, are overseen by other people, okay, outside of the Treasury Department and have very specific reporting requirements. So again, we're happy to sit down with your staff and go through any of the specifics. I, I want to acknowledge uh, we think that the IG's role, particularly I would comment, in, in, in the area of uh, uh, tax administration is, is very important. Sure. Well, and uh, TGITA is cut, but obviously the IRS is growing uh, and hopefully growing to a significant amount to be able to continue its job. But thank you. Ms. Joyce? Wait, I, go back. I would certainly defer if Mr. Torres has a question at this time. Mr. Torres. Thank you, and thank you for bringing up the issue of cannabis. Um, when there's so much uh, cash around, um, it creates a lot of problems. And you know, when I look at crime around um, facilities that um, sell uh, cannabis, it's it's a it's a big issue in our communities. And I hope that you will take some time to look into that. Um, I want to go back to the issue of uh, forfeiture uh, funds. Um, I just want to get clarification um, that the funds required to operate the TFF, um, the amount that you gave us, $71 million, is adequate, is an adequate amount to leave in the fund that we should consider? I believe it is, but since you've asked me the question twice, what I would say is, let me go back and just confirm that with my internal group, because you're obviously have raised some concerns about this, and we will follow up with your staff uh, to make sure that we're 100 percent comfortable on that and can update you on why we feel that's the case. I, I appreciate that, and, and I apologize. Usually I like to send my uh, questions in advance so that um, our guests are prepared to uh, answer my concerns. Um, it would have been helpful if the chairman had sent me the question about the NCAA in, 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 in advance. So I want to talk fine, about um, the Northern Triangle uh, countries, uh, Guatemala, uh, El Salvador, and Honduras. Um, obviously, you know, we have a humanitarian crisis at the border with, you know, 
hundreds uh, of people coming north. Um, very difficult situation there, not only with crime, but very, very corrupt uh, governments. Um, it's unfortunate that we have provided very little political support for um, CSIG, which is, you know, the UN um, um, investigative body that is commissioned that is there um, to help provide support to the Attorney General and in um, Honduras is MOXIE. Last Wednesday, April 3rd, the Department of State provided Congress with a list of corrupt um, officials from the Northern Triangle countries, which was required by my amendment in fiscal year 19 in DAA. Um, as I've already said publicly, I was very disappointed with that list. Um, I was very disappointed um, to see um, many officials that we know are dealing in narcotics and uh, very much involved in narco-trafficking were not on that list. Uh, so Mr. Secretary, given the very short list that we have, um, do you see any reason why those individuals on such a list, um, which was created by the uh, Department of State, uh, should not be sanctioned under the Magnitsky Act? Uh, in general, let me just comment, uh, I, I work very closely with Secretary Pompeo uh, and the State Department on many issues and the sanctions. I'm not familiar with this list per se. I will follow up with the Secretary and uh, both, both to understand the list and uh, review if it's appropriate for sanctions. Uh, it does sound like it's something we should look at and, and take into consideration. As I said, we've, we've used these obviously in many other areas. I'm more familiar with, in the case of Mexico and Venezuela, of, of drug trafficking and other issues, but uh, I will follow up on that. Um, again, uh, if we want to deal with the issues that we have at our southern border, um, you know, we can't be negligent and not pay attention to the very corrupt governments in the Northern Triangle. Uh, the reason why these people are fleeing is because there's no justice, there's no access to justice, um, and their governments are stealing uh, funding that should be available to create uh, programs for education. And um, I hate to continue to devastate other budgets that are critically needed in our communities, um, like the forfeiture funding, to build the wall when the answer is right in front of us, and that is dealing with the corrupt people. They should not have a visa, and they should not have access to our financial institutions here in the U.S., not when we know, and we're very clear, that they are dealing and they are no narco-traffickers. Well, let, let me, uh, again, agree with you completely that uh, Treasury and this administration in no way uh, wants to look the other way when we're aware of corruption in, in foreign governments and these sanctions work and we will follow up with your office to make sure that corrupt officials do not have access to our financial system. Thank you. I appreciate my time is up and I yield back. Thank you. Mr. Joyce. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, on that point, uh, Secretary Mnuchin, can you explain uh, what you're doing to help federal, state, and local law enforcement develop the intelligence to understand how drug organizations and laundering their drug proceeds, or how they're laundering their drug proceeds, and uh, what uh, you're doing with the government of China to stop the flow of fentanyl into this country, because obviously we have a tremendous amount of overdose deaths that exceed uh, car accidents and everything else now. Sure, well, let, let me answer your second question first, because that's something that I'm very, very familiar with. Uh, I participated in the meeting between President Trump and President Xi, where President Trump specifically asked President Xi to change the classification of fentanyl so that it would be illegal uh, in, in China. Um, that's something that President Xi said was very difficult to do, but because the request came from President Trump, that was a commitment he made on the spot. Uh, I, I understand that a lot of that is in the works and has changed, and that's a specific area where uh, we very appreciate uh, China working with us on that, because I think, you know, fentanyl is a very significant issue in this country and a big concern of President Trump's. Um, as it relates to your first question, um, 
our specific role at Treasury is obviously where we have any specific intelligence in enforcing the sanctions as it relates to money laundering. We also work very closely through FinCEN with all the banks on money laundering as it relates to specific state and local uh, uh, areas. That's obviously something that we do on an interagency basis. Uh, we are not always the primary lead on, but uh, I assure you money laundering is, is one of our top priorities uh, that we focus on. Thank you for the work that you're doing there. Um, secondly, I know that when we were in the majority that uh, we uh, took great pleasure in cutting the amount of money that was going to the IRS every year. And I know that you've taken it under your wing to, and the budget request proposes investments to implement your integrated modernization business plan to modernize IRS systems, which I applaud, and taxpayer services in two three-year phases beginning in 2019. How will this modernization plan improve the long-term operations of the IRS and the service provided to taxpayers and businesses alike? Well, th thank, thank you for raising that issue, because uh, I would say if there's one of the most important things that I think this committee can do is uh, to give us the funding to invest in modernization at the IRS. The IRS has underfunded their technology for years and years. This is not a Republican or a Democrat issue. This has crossed uh, multiple administrations. Um, it's, it's somewhat embarrassing that we are operating at the size and scale we are. The IRS is under attack all the time for cyber issues and that we are on dated technology. I think, as you know, we had a problem last year, not this year, on, on tax day because of this dated technology. Uh, and I would also say that uh, taxpayers deserve to have capabilities of online customer service that are consistent with other big financial institutions. Taxpayers are paying the government uh, significant amounts of their hard-earned money, and they should be able to have access to information. They should be able to communicate. Um, in this day and age, calling up and asking to speak to a person on the phone um, is not necessarily the most efficient thing to do. And let me just comment, this, is, this has to be multi-year funding. So for this to be effective, we need multi-year funding. This can't be turned on and off. This is going to take five or six years uh, to, to implement. Um, is it an investment also in the data services, the infrastructure there? I know the one thing I've seen is pretty dated. Uh, what the equipment that you're uh, you have, you're forced to use down there is going back uh, it, to the old it's, mainframe it's, days. It's, it's a combination of hardware, software, business processes. It impacts every single area. It impacts our enforcement. It impacts our customer service. Over time, by the IRS taking in all this data, we should be able to do more of our enforcement electronically using technology. And uh, ta taxpayers deserve to have a better experience which we need this investment in technology to do. Thank you, sir. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you. Uh, and, sir, I can't agree more. We obviously need to, on a bipartisan basis, help modernize the IRS. And I hope we're all in agreement that we need to make sure they have the resources uh, to enforce those efforts as well and that the, those dollars aren't taken away every year or reduced every year in the process to help fund the other parts of the agency. Uh, Mr. Christ. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you, Secretary, uh, for being with us today. Uh, Mr. Secretary, I want to talk about cash. Um, you oversee a lot of important agencies, sir, designed to keep Americans safe and keep the financial system secure. And there is a vast regulatory system built on that, monitoring everything from bank accounts to wire transfers, from terrorist financing, real estate fraud, insider trading, even Russian sanctions, as it were. When money touches the U.S. financial system, it's almost like it comes into the light. I like that. I'm from Florida, and we appreciate transparency, as I'm sure you do. Uh, we like to say that sunlight is, in fact, the best disinfectant. I'm grateful to all of the folks at Treasury who are utilizing financial regulations to find the bad guys, throw them in jail, keep the American people safe. They have a lot of tools, and they know how to use them and use them well. But this is a question about cash. Uh, would you briefly explain to me, uh, from a law enforcement perspective, 
what happens when markets exist in cash only? Um, well, for, first of all, thank you for your acknowledgement of the, the, the many areas. Cash, um, obviously, particularly as it relates to the U.S. financial system, um, we need to be able to track cash uh, when it comes in and out of the banking system so that cash transactions are not used for illicit purposes. I would also say a big focus of ours has also been crypto assets for similar reasons that cryptocurrencies can be used like cash for illicit activities. So ca cash is something that uh, is very important to, to monitor. Um, on the other hand, I, I do just want to acknowledge, despite the world that we live in, which is going more and more digital, uh, the worldwide demand for U.S. cash uh, is significant. And we, uh, being the reserve currency of the world, we have to be careful in being able to properly enforce and uh, monitor these cash transactions with, with that. Yes, sir. Uh, it seems like from a financial crime standpoint, uh, money laundering, tax evasion, even armed robbery, cash only isn't great. It seems like as policymakers, uh, you and I would want to steer commerce out of the all cash space and into regulated space. Would you agree with that by and large? Again, I just, I want to be careful because yes, as a general matter, uh, okay, cash transactions create a more complicated regulatory environment. Um, on the other hand, as I said, I want to be very careful that we don't regulate that you can't use cash. Fair enough. My home state recently legalized medical marijuana, overwhelmingly, uh, and the industry has responded, Mr. Secretary. By 2020, the regulated, licensed, and taxed cannabis market in my state alone could come close to a billion dollars. But because of a discrepancy in federal and state law and a failure of Congress to act and a failure of regulators to be proactive, this regulated, licensed, voter-approved billion-dollar industry is going to be all cash. Uh, I note a 5.86% increase requested for Financial Crimes Enforcement Network, or FinCEN. I assume this increase is because you all want to catch more bad guys and make families more safe. Uh, so uh, why then uh, is Treasury not doing everything at its disposal to create a workable, reasonable, confidence-inspiring way to make it safe for these companies to bring their revenues into the sunlight? Uh, Mr. Chris, we've, we've had other, a few other comments on this uh, earlier. So again, let me just say, I hope this is something this committee can on a bipartisan basis work with since there's people on both sides of the aisle that share these concerns. Um, I will just say, uh, I, I don't believe this is a failure of the regulators. I, I want to defend the regulators on this issue. The problem is, uh, okay, there is a conflict between the federal law and the state law. And, and I'm not making a, a policy comment on what, what the right outcome is, but I too share your concern, whether it's my supervision of the IRS, where I've already said we have to build cash rooms to take in cash, uh, which creates all different types of security issues. Um, there, there is not a Treasury solution to this. There is not a regulator solution to this. Um, if this is something that you know Congress wants to look at on a bipartisan basis, uh, I'd, I'd encourage you to do this. This is something where there is a conflict between federal and state law that we and the regulators have no way of dealing with. Thank you. Your encouragement is appreciated, Mr. Secretary. Thank you so much. Mr. Chairman, I yield. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to close by uh, commending you as I did in the beginning and question you as I did in the beginning. Uh, I, again, I want to thank you for the notion of uh, including increases for both the Office of Terrorism and Financial Intelligence and the Financial Crimes Enforcement Network. We want to work with you to make sure we use those, those precious resources appropriately. Uh, uh, Mr. Chris talked about transparency. Uh, he was quoting the people of Florida, but it's actually Justice Brandeis that uh, 
sunshine is the best of disinfectants. Uh, respectfully, sir, I would disagree with you in the notion that your office should be reviewing this, this decision, uh, the request coming from Chairman of Ways and Means at all. But um, in the final analysis, I think you need to appreciate the fact, and I'm asking you if you do, uh, what Mr. Chris brought up. There's a reason that presidents release their tax returns, right? There's a reason these regulations were put in place and the, and the ability to do this. And it's certainly not anything novel has been suggested recently. Richard Nixon, Gerald Ford, Nelson Rockefeller all had congressional hearings relating to their tax returns. There's something you trade off when you do what the President of the United States does. And it's generally the notion that the public has a right to know and make the decision on their own whether a lawmaker is making a decision based on their own interest or on someone else's. So would you acknowledge there's, there's a reason these presidents return, release their returns and that there, there is call for transparency matters at this time in our nation's history? Well, I, I believe that these presidents release their returns on a voluntary basis. I'm not aware of that there's any law that required them to. Well, I would you acknowledge that there is a reason they did it, that they're not doing it I, I don't to show people how to fill out a tax return if you're the president? Again, they made individual decisions. I would just also like to say there is a requirement for presidents to have financial disclosure. I believe that this president has com complied with that, as other people. And the general public, when they elected President Trump, uh, made the decision to elect him without his tax returns being released. Now, since we opened with this, okay, I, I guess I just we can't can do help. better with an answer. I, I just can't help but but say, since you made the comment on uh, President Obama and being looked at, I, 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 I a little sure, bit. I, I am sure there are many prominent Democrats who are relieved that. Uh, when Kevin Brady was chairman of the committee that he, he didn't request specific returns. But anyway, it is a pleasure to be here it was with you today. And, and President Obama released uh, visitor I, I, records. I wasn't President refer Obama was more transparent than the last 10 presidents. I wasn't referring president. to presidents. I was referring to other members of Congress, prominent Democratic people who may support people, ordinary taxpayers. But in any event, it is a pleasure to be here with you today. Uh, to address the funding, and we look forward to working with you on many of these bipartisan issues. And, and this is a technical question that someone asked. Uh, will you submit DHS's request for funding for the record? Uh, I, I assume we'd be more than happy to, to do that. Uh, just make sure I check on that, but I don't see any reason why that wouldn't be the case. Very good. Thank you. This meeting is adjourned.